This week's video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Stay tuned to find out how you can get Surfshark for 83% off plus three months for free. I'm a loser. I'm a loser. Yellow. You son of a yellow dog. What are you trying to push on me? Zuh? Oh, you think it's funny? You think it's funny to send me this, this, this ultimate death match? What the hell's wrong with you, man? I, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. What do you want, dweeb? Oh, I can't believe I just watched this thing. A god-awful movie like this, left on my doorstep, under the cover of night. Don't think I don't know what you're up to, man. Look, Zane, I swear on the soul of my kick-ass Lemmy chops from the mid-2000s, may they rest in peace, sir, I had nothing to do with whatever ultimate death jam vendetta you're talking about, okay? Oh, come on. This has got your fingerprints all over it. You do this to me all the time. Quite frankly, Zane, I have more important things to do in life than to torment you like, oh, I don't know, running a sports entertainment empire, uh, you dig? Boop. Boop. It's all about me. How you play me? I hate Brian Zane. He's got rabies. It's all about debt. Okay, well, he might not have sent me this video, but I sure as hell got this neon green loogie of a film from somewhere. Legitimately, this case smells like fish, and I have no idea why. It's Ultimate Deathmatch, a thriller, or is it a horror film, from 2009 by director Sean Kane. It's a story of a disgraced wrestling promoter trying to grab the spotlight one more time with an ambitious underground project, where wrestlers fight to the death for a massive cash prize. And who's stepping up for a chance at immortality? Why just this motley crew of Pacific Northwest-based wrestlers with a wide variety of looks and abilities, all without the assistance of an editor? Not only is Kane the director and the producer of this movie, he also has a starring role. Oh wait, I'm sorry, he's the special guest star. Like, it's a super big deal this guy is all over his own movie. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself here. All you have to know is this movie really sucks in a lot of different ways. And I'm here to tell you about it because history shows you love seeing me get angry on this channel. Well, drink it in. The movie opens up with what appears to be a short behind the scenes clip of Kane, Kevin Nash, and Shane Douglas talking to a group of people off camera at the OVW Arena in Louisville. Listen as they pine for the good old days for some reason. When Kevin was kicking Vince's ass 81 weeks in a row, what was your ratings? You were around a 6-7? Yeah. About 6. And then right behind him was ECW that was pulling a 4-5-5. Five, five. If the original ECW were pulling fours and fives in the ratings back in the TNN days, I feel the last 20 years or so of wrestling might have gone very differently. Anyway, you're never seeing those guys again in this movie, as they're suddenly flung back to the squished black and white past. Jesus Christ, man. People die in football. People die in MMA every fucking day. They take away my fucking license. Sean Kane plays promoter Jake Reed, the former head of the Federation of Pro Wrestling, which is mentioned on the back of the DVD cover and literally nowhere else. Apparently, a wrestler died of a heart attack in the ring during an FPW pay-per-view. I don't know. Considering Vincent Mann suffered almost no consequences after a wrestler died in his ring from a botched stunt, a heart attack seems like a reach to justify Jake losing his license. As Jake's talking with the bartender, we cut to a pair of wrestlers elsewhere in the room, sideshow and to fool the butcher who, who. Let's just move on, okay? The two accuse Jake of somehow playing a role in the wrestler's death before suddenly a bar fight breaks out. His name's Johnny. <laughs> Johnny, motherfucker. Yes, we'll never forget the brave sacrifice made by that beloved wrestler, Johnny Motherfucker! Now suddenly, Jake's having a chat with Al Snow at the OVW Arena, only it's not Al Snow, it's Frosty James. And it's not Al Snow's wife, Bobcat, it's... D what? Bobcat? Pussy Willow? Jesus God in heaven, it's not every day I encounter my biggest wrestling traumas in the first five minutes of a movie! In regards to the death of Johnny Motherfucker, Jake and Frosty condense the entire Over the Edge 99 debate into two sentences, then Jake shifts gears and declares he's running an exciting new event. But I came up with this idea. It's called the Ultimate Death Match. 
It's an underground tournament to be streamed online where the winner will get millions of dollars, but he has to literally kill his final opponent to win. So the promoter who became infamous for a wrestler dying in his ring is now starting up a show where the ultimate goal is to murder your opponent. It's a weird flex to want to lean into that kind of reputation. It'd be like if a chef who gave an entire restaurant food poisoning suddenly opened up a new place called Café de la Dile. Snowy the Frost Man explains to his wife that he's been told nobody's really going to die in this thing. At least I think that's what he's saying since the microphone is not pointed in his direction. I mean, it's complete work. It's all fake. So. Are you going to trust that jackass? Are you serious? Seriously. Listen. Apparently the demand for such barbaric entertainment is so great in this world, federal freaking agents are being called upon to investigate. But while the ATF agent, who appears to be played by one of the grips from the film crew, wants to crack down, the FBI agent in charge is a little bit skeptical of what's going on. For God's sake, relax. It's professional wrestling. No one's gonna die. This is professional wrestling. For God's sake, this is the FBI. I mean, look at how dramatically lit this office is. Here's more OVW footage as Jay talks about the tournament with some wrestlers, none of whom you will see for the rest of the movie. Say goodbye to Louisville and hello to this random club in Longview, Washington for some reason and we're just diving right in, okay! Hello folks, I'm Frosty James. And I'm Double R. And welcome to the Ultimate Death Match. Leading man Al Snow, everybody. Just look at him. Frosty and his ill-fitting blazer are joined by a man inexplicably named Double R, who has clearly also been hired for his fine acting abilities. It's the Beast taking on Dash Venture. Holy shit, guys, you know you can do multiple takes, right? It's like this all over the movie. Oh my Lanta, get a load of this set, folks. Gotta love the conspicuous spotlights shining into the cameras half the time, mixed with the natural daylight coming from the front door, the name of the venue on a bedsheet above the ring you can barely make out, the two dozen or so fans who answer this highly professional flyer that called for extras, half the crew clearly visible, and all that dead space. Take a good look, because 90% of the rest of the movie takes place here. Just think, in this universe, there are millions of people tuning in online to watch this stunning product, all because of the promise of an in death. My, my, just look at our standards. Oh my god, the whole vibe for this is so depressing and so cheap. I just, I can't even look at this anymore. My god. Hey Zane. Blah! Big Hoss, what are you doing here? Just wanted to talk to you about this week's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. What? It's the virtual private network that guarantees your online safety. Yeah, yeah, I know sir- all that, but are we really doing the ad right now? Hey, do you want to break from that stupid movie or don't you? You're right. I'm sorry. Keep going. Anyway, Surfshark encrypts all your data so nobody can see your passwords, your private messages, or any of that stuff. You can stay safe on public Wi-Fi, access content from anywhere by changing the location of your server, meaning you can access 15 different Netflix libraries from around the world. It can even make your gaming experience better. Hoss, you're just an old 80s wrestler. What do you know about video games? You know what? I've been hearing a lot of that ageist crap lately, and I'm tired of it. Just just tell us the offer already, Big Hoss. Rat rat. People can support the channel by downloading Surfshark using the link in the description, then using the code REGRET to get 83% off and three extra months for free. Okay, thank you very much, Big Hoss. Uh, anything else you want to say before I keep going? Well, since I got you here, Zane, I wanted to see if you put any more thought into that merch idea I pitched you a couple months ago. Big Hoss McGraw's Jelly Gimmick. It'll get over big with the kiddos. Yeah, not right now. Goodbye. Moving on. Yeah, I mean, the uh, Roman gladiators have been doing it thousands of years ago. That's right, Frosty. But tonight... Our charismatic commentators explain that it's a round-robin tournament, even though it's run like a standard single elimination tournament. They also emphasize the only person dying will be the loser of the main event, which contradicts itself from what the DVD cover clearly says in red type, only for it to counter itself again the very next sentence. They say the winner will receive $3 million. The actual amount keeps going up throughout the movie as more people watch, though, even though it's never explained. You know, they say the devil's in the details, and I guess Sean Kane didn't want to risk unleashing the devil because of his work. (laughs) No, somebody else already did that. Maybe instead of hyping up the director as a special guest star, they could have used that same energy to find a special guest editor or a special guest sound guy, because this movie could have freaking used them. Whenever you see a physical microphone in this movie, you can bet that 9 times out of 10, it will not be on. What would motivate a man to take a risk like this? I'm here with Ilya, the Russian python, a world-renowned professional athlete. Now we're into our first of our semi-final round matches. One step closer to that $3 million. Laces TKO across the top. Russia's 
losing his pants. And oh my god, the editing, or I guess the lack thereof, to the man in charge, this awkward long shot of the announcers gradually drifting off center was good enough for the final cut of the movie. Then there are the matches themselves. Almost all of them are shown in their entirety with live commentary throughout. They all go way too long, which might not have been a big deal if they were more exciting or if the filmmakers added some pizzazz in post. There are no quick cuts, no crowd shots or anything to break it up. It just makes everything drag. I never thought I'd say this, but I think we need a little more Kevin Dunn energy here. The opening match sees The Beast, played by Matt Farmer, taking on a guy named Larkin. One thing's for sure, now would be a good time to have some carefully scripted promos. In a, in a competition where clearly the promoter has stated that someone's gonna die. Who cares? What do you mean, who cares? It doesn't matter. <laughs> and then I would drink the blood out of that stupid son of a bitch I'm gonna wrestle, cause I'm gonna fuck his ass up, I'm gonna get paid, and I'm gonna get some fucking pussy. Ow! Even though the matches drag on a bit, at least the commentary makes up for it. Oh, a knee to the asshole! Another brutal donkey punch to the back of Larkin's head. There are some cutaways during the matches of this group, some sort of Texas businessman and his flock of pretty ladies. And Wednesday Adams is there too, I guess. The way they keep cutting to that guy, you know, you just know he's gonna be really important to the story later on. You just wait and see. We get some practical effects in our first batch of corn syrup blood for the day as Beast gouges out Larkin's eye, then decks him from behind with a cinder block. Of all the camera angles they could have used, they went with this one. <sighs> now you might recall them saying that no one was supposed to die until the final round. Well the funny thing is, nobody told the guys in the ring that. Remember when I brought up how even the DVD cover couldn't figure out how many would die in this story? Well, that lack of clarity also affected the wrestlers picked for this movie. According to a couple of them I talked to in doing my research, they were given almost zero input in how to craft their matches and were basically told us to make it work. Almost all of them planned their finishes for death because none of them were told that only one person's supposed to get killed in the end. Meanwhile, in Jake's evil lair, he talks to his mysterious colleague and figures that now is the best time to ask how he got that eye patch. <laughs> I don't remember. That, that cover, how do you not, what kind of covers I don't remember? Have I mentioned we're only 15 minutes into this movie? Someone's gonna die tonight. Someone will die. Oh, I don't doubt that. I don't doubt that at all. And it sure would be nice to find out why this is all happening, but we don't. Meanwhile, at the FBI building, they're still surveilling the action, but God forbid they do anything about it. He just didn't understand you or your art. Tool painting is a very important art form. Bye, Mom. She might be a famous tool painter one day. Well, that's boring as hell, but look, they changed the lighting a bit. Up next is Jimmy Flame versus Azul Angel. Quite the flippy match where it's essentially blood sport. I don't want to spend all video harping on the editing here. I'm just saying it would have been nice to cut away from Flame blatantly signaling for Azul to come to him in front of everybody. Come on, guys. Is Azul a gang member, you think? He looks like he's representing the Crips. Geez, did Jeffrey J. James have a hand in writing this? In the middle of this match, in which both men are bleeding strawberry jam profusely, Azul decides to just get out of the ring and kiss his wife, I think they said? Seems like good enough timing, I guess. After more botches in the middle of this movie scene they could have easily reshot, Flame finally wins after choking out his opponent with a chain. Who oh boy, this has been rough. Our next fight features Dash Venture going up against Aaron Bolo, whose girlfriend is also at ringside at one point in the match. Not sure why so many guys are in a hurry to bring their significant others to this underground fight club of death, but hey, every relationship needs a little danger, I guess. It's one of the shortest matches in the movie, and it ends with the only guy in the whole thing with any kind of look getting jobbed out. They can't even book this thing well. Hey, good night, Aaron Bolo! Oh, now you pick a time to make an edit. He really wants to win, doesn't he, Doc? Yes, he does. What do you want me to feel here? Our final match of the first round features Polly Venture versus the Russian Python. There's no relation between Polly and Dash, but they decided to keep these guys' names as is and nobody seemed to care. Let's hear the motives of these fighters. I just love killing people! Fascinating. I'm doing it for the money. That's why I'm here. Um... The only thing I have at stake is getting my family back. Back from what, you may ask? They'll never tell. The match begins with some weak-ass attacks by the Python and a graceful entry into the ring. But some more corn syrup blood and a knee to the head is all it takes for Polly to win. Despite not bleeding at all during the match, he's suddenly bleeding profusely the next time we see him backstage as he gets a needle stuck in his bicep. You know, fight club stuff. 
We see Jake Reed and his one-eyed friend colluding with the Beast. Then we go to a random fight in progress between Steve Rush and TKO. TKO is given a credit as stunt coordinator for the film, which means he took a bump into some thumbtacks. Thanks for your sacrifice, kid. This scene will never be referenced again, and neither of you advance. Oh, there's that cowboy again. I just can't wait to see what his role is going to be in all this. Maybe he's a mysterious benefactor. Or, ooh, maybe he's an oil tycoon looking to get his kicks. I mean, the possibilities of where they're going to go with this guy are endless. We finally get a recap of round one, or app round. Oh my god, they blew up the size of the high package? Why? On we go to round two, where it feels that the action in the ring lines up with the stakes in the film at least a little bit better than in round one. And the commentary is still fire emoji. Sidewalk slam! I think I saw a gerbil squirt out of Dash Fincher's ass! Why didn't we get this kind of commentary on Heat all those years ago? The Beast wins his next match over Dash Venture with a DDT. Then it's time for Jimmy Flame versus Polly Venture, who I'm pretty sure is not an actual wrestler because he hasn't taken one bump so far in this movie. This is this is action on Spielbergian proportions. Yes, Al, it's almost as if Steven Spielberg directed this thing. If he were drunk, suffered a massive stroke, and wore his ball cap over his eyes, then it'd be very similar to that. Where is Jimmy Flame going? He, I mean, he rolled out of the ring. He doesn't have a clue. What are we doing here? Fucking cut some of this! In a finish right out of the back bar wrestling scene, Polly wins the match by simply throwing Flame out of the ring. We then go right to the round two recap sized properly this time. Their highlights of the matches we just saw only edited down for brevity, which they should have done from the fucking beginning. Backstage, evil promoter Jeff meets with Polly, who's so cool he's got to wear sunglasses in this very dark room. I think he's going to try to hurt you. I think he's going to try to kill you. <laughs> Man, I didn't sign up for all that. I didn't sign up to kill anybody. The hell you did! It's ultimate death match. Death is the whole premise of this entire tournament. Have you not been listening to Frosty's very clever commentary about this? Jake warns Polly the Beast is going to try and kill him in the finals for real. But since Jake is already working with the Beast, wouldn't it be smarter just to convince Polly that it was all still a work so he'd be lulled into a false sense of security? I tell you, Sean Kane's been drinking far too much of the strawberry jam. Not only will he live, but he'll have enough money to get his family back. From who? Dr. Evil? Just before the final match, Eye Patch Guy tells Polly to drink from this cup he just stuck a syringe into. Polly, who as it turns out is an idiot, drinks from it and heads out to the ring, completely unaware that treachery is afoot. No, I want you to go this way. Oh. Okay, that right there is my favorite part of this movie. You guessed it, that glass was full of drugs. The Russian python runs in and joins in the mugging of a defenseless... Oh. Are we sure it was Polly who took the drugs? This beatdown feels like it goes on for ages, feeling longer and longer with every shitty strike from this guy. Is someone gonna die here or what? At this point, I'll volunteer. So Polly Venture, the only person you could possibly consider a hero in this picture, is suddenly out of the equation. Is he alive? Is he dead? Who gives a shit? The finals are now the Beast versus the Python. What the hell has gone on here tonight? I'm asking myself the same thing. Steamroller. Oh no. <laughs> so here we are, a heel versus heel final battle between an underdeveloped character played by arguably the most seasoned worker of the bunch and someone who we don't care about at all who is obviously the least. I hate all of this. It's a shame that so much of this movie is based on what happens in the ring when so much of that looks so bad. At last we get an appropriate cutaway as they mess up the pile driver, then we cut back to a much better camera showing the fatal move. Oh my god, he could have broken his neck. Frosty finally understands the gravity of the situation and realizes that millions of people just watched a man die in the ring after being told it was all gonna be a work. It's Johnny Motherfucker all over again. It took long enough, but this moment right here is actually Al Snow's best bit of acting in this movie. But let's be honest, it's not the first time Al Snow's been part of a match that died. Oh, got him! Put him up there, Mick! <laughs> I love a good Al Snow joke. Good one, Bri. Give me five. Yeah! Yeah, woo! That was worth every bit of those 75 bucks. All right, Doc. Let's roll up. Let's get out of here. I'll get the helicopter. These guys look as if they couldn't afford to rent a fucking kite, let alone fly off in a helicopter. The fans start pouring out of the building, including the cowboy businessman and his ladies. Thanks for coming, friends. So glad we just kept cutting to you all movie as if there was a reason for it. 
<sighs> you and I and everyone watching, we're responsible. We're a part of that murder. We, were, we had our hand in it. Remember the federal agents from earlier? Well, we finally get to see how they're doing, and the FBI guy feels like a proper dum-dum for having let the murder go on unabated. I can't believe it. We've got a murder to solve. That delivery. Exquisite. We're then shown credits for the tournament, not the movie itself. It's all so terribly done, it's hard to tell which is which, but I think the fake one has all the silly names and the cheesy music. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Why is Double R credited as Brutus Beefcake? What? 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 Frosty confronts Jake, who basically tells him that he's in too deep and warns him he can take the money or get caught holding the bag. Soon, Frosty resigns to his fate. Today, we're bathing fire. Tomorrow, Wait, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Tomorrow. You gotta love it. The music is so loud it drowns out his dialogue. Boy, it'd be really embarrassing if that were the last line in the movie. Oh, never mind. Oh, God, it's over. It's finally over. God, I thought Slammed was bad. I know WEW was shit. I thought that was gonna be the worst of it for a while, but then this, this darkened my doorstep. From a writing standpoint, Ultimate Deathmatch makes no sense. From an acting standpoint, Ultimate Deathmatch feels like amateur hour. And from a production standpoint, Ultimate Deathmatch is the absolute drizzling shits. This film was directed by someone with no clear vision, filmed by people with no eye for composition or ear for sound, and edited by someone with no sense of timing or aesthetic. Every moment of this film felt more agonizing than the last, due in large part because of how ramshackle and unprofessional it looked. It cannot be overstated just how bad the production is in this, because it makes all the other glaring issues of the movie that much worse. What makes me even more upset is, I know so many of the guys in this movie. This is a segment, albeit a small one, of the Pacific Northwest indie scene from back then. I was part of this for a time, but with a few notable exceptions, this feels like a damning indictment of the scene of that period. These poor bastards were set up to fail because they were told to just go out there and do stuff and it all be cut down. But almost nothing was cut because if they did, the movie wouldn't have come close to feature length. That led to a bunch of matches that didn't look great with a handful of guys who weren't fully developed, some glaringly so. Not great when wrestling is the crux of the movie. I have seen some bad movies on here before, some with even worse writing and acting, but it's the combination of those things along with the truly abysmal and lazy production value that makes Ultimate Deathmatch take the cake. I mean, how much worse can it get? And you know what, November? We get to do this again. Do it again? Well, it explains how I also got these sequels sent to me. Yeet!